Well, good evening, everyone. And again, welcome to this joint webinar between Conservative Health and Society of Conservative Lawyers. Just to introduce myself briefly, I'm Ed Ludlow. I'll run the tech side of things in the background. Um, just to make you aware that we are recording this event and it will be available on social media afterwards. Um, any problems during this, you can message me. Uh, I think my details are on the email as well. Uh, please submit any questions via the Q&A window or via the chat and they'll be fielded towards the end of the event. And now I will hand over to Lord Ribeiro, who is President of Conservative Health, to open the event formally. Thank you very much indeed, Ed. Uh, may I first of all welcome all of you to this virtual meeting, which I hope will be the first of many between Conservative Health and the Society of Conservative Lawyers. To be debating a topic which led the 6pm news tonight suggests we back the right horse. And I thank our chairman, Professor Ray Poles and Sir Bob Neill for choosing the topic. Tonight, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Jeremy Hunt, who is a patron of Conservative Health. He was, I think one has to agree, uh, an outstanding uh, Secretary of State, but more of that later on. He will be our opening speaker tonight, and I welcome you, Jeremy, to the uh, event. He has said that he will be happy to take some questions afterwards, although we will try and aim for a 7.30 uh, stop if we can. Jeremy Hunt was elected MP for West Surrey in 2005 and quickly became a shadow minister under David Cameron for disabled people and then culture, media and sport. In 2010, he became Secretary of State for Culture, the Olympics, media and sport. And he oversaw the third Olympic Games in the UK, arguably the best. He became the longest serving Secretary of State for Health in British history from 2012 to 2018, adding social care to the last year of his brief. From 2018-19, he was Foreign Secretary and subsequently is now Chairman of the Health Select Committee in the House of Commons, where he brings his enormous experience of health care to the committee. As the lead for the health services among backbench Conservative peers, it was a pleasure always to work closely with Jeremy during his period as Health Secretary, where I witnessed his passion for dealing with issues around patient safety and care, something he continues to do in his position on the Health Select Committee. Today's headline, as uh, I commented earlier to colleagues, uh, was next to a Times piece that said, the end is in sight. Sounds more like the end is nigh, but never mind, the end is in sight. No doubt nicked from the Prime Minister's letters to colleagues yesterday, uh, in, in which uh, he said that the uh, jab passport could unlock mass events. And it also became the headline on today's six o'clock news. The Prime Minister noted four key questions, which will be the subject of four reviews. The third one of these will consider the potential role COVID status certificates will have in helping venues to open up safely. But he goes on to say, but mindful of the many concerns surrounding exclusion, discrimination, and privacy. Tonight, therefore, provides an opportunity to address many of these issues, and I'm sure Jeremy and others, other speakers will do just that. So without further ado, I will call on Jeremy Hunt, MP, to address us and join us. If you have any questions, could you put them up in the chat and we will select uh, one or two uh, and see if he has time to answer them. Jeremy, thank you. Thank you very much, Bernie, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's a real privilege to talk to such a distinguished group of people. And I actually signed up for this, Bernie, because I want to hear what some of the other brilliant uh, panellists have got to say on this issue, because I, I want to learn about it. But um, let me just uh, start by saying that I really enjoyed working with you when I was Health Secretary. Um, you were uh, an absolutely fantastic voice of sanity in the House of Lords and in your chairmanship of an incredibly political hot potato with the independent reconfiguration panel. So, uh, so thank you for the brilliant work you did for, for our party and the country. Um, 
I think um, when I left the Department of Health and became Foreign Secretary, um, I became very conscious. I visited 31 countries in the year that I was Foreign Secretary, and I, I realized that uh, other countries often have a whole lot more respect for Britain than we sometimes have for ourselves. And I asked myself why that was. And I think the reason, it, it, it's not uh, because of our historical glories, it's because we are seen around the world as the country alongside the United States that has done more to champion liberty and the rule of law um, and the current international order than any other country. And we are seen as a country that has fought for liberty in Europe, but also in our own history over the last thousand years. Has, it's really been a history of progressively building up the liberties of individual citizens against an overweening state. So I completely understand the nervousness that people feel about um, uh, coronavirus passports. And that's why I actually think it, what Boris Johnson did yesterday is a very, very smart thing. He's making it very clear that he's not sold on the idea, he's not gonna rush into it, and he's gonna get some clever people to look at it in enormous detail before he decides what the government should do. Um, but I just want to urge everyone as we form our own views on this, uh, to have an open mind because I think the ethical considerations are actually very complex. And Bernie very nicely just talked about my, my commitment to patient safety. And for those who, um, who aren't from the medical world, this is really, uh, there's, a, there's a big patient safety movement around the world, very troubled by the high levels of avoidable harm and death that we have in modern healthcare systems. And I want to just give you a patient safety dilemma that's nothing to do with coronavirus, um, but just to illustrate why I think there is complexity in this. And this is a hospital that I visited in Seattle, which uh, is called Virginia Mason Hospital, which is famous for being one of the safest hospitals in the world. And they pioneered uh, some of the safest care in the world. And they have an extraordinary open learning culture. And uh, they done something we don't do in the NHS, which is they make it mandatory for all their staff to have winter flu jabs every year. They say, if you're not prepared to have a winter flu jab, you can't work at this hospital. And uh, when I went to visit this hospital, they told me of the enormous anger amongst the medical staff that was created when they introduced this. Um, but it was actually the suggestion of a very junior nurse who said, when I was looking at this issue, I started researching flu and I realized that you can actually carry and transmit flu for a few days without showing any symptoms. And I thought, well, what about my patients in that situation? And so she proposed this idea because they're a very patient safety conscious hospital. And then they had a very stormy meeting of all the medics in the hospital. And one medic got up and said, I come from another country and I came to America as the land of freedom and no one is gonna tell me what I have to inject myself with. Uh, to which, uh, and the chief executive of the hospital thought he was gonna to have to stand up and it was gonna be a very unfortunate moment. But then a, another doctor stood up and said, that's absolutely fine. You don't have to inject yourself with a flu jab, but I don't want you going near a single one of my patients. And the point is that liberty is not just about the protection of our own rights. It's about making sure that we don't take actions that impinge on other people's rights. Now, if my mother is a, is a healthy uh, lady in her 80s. Thankfully, she's not in a care home, but were she in a care home, and were she to have caught coronavirus because one of the staff working in the care home had refused to have a vaccine, I would feel pretty angry. And I am not a lawyer, but I would feel, you know, that I would want to have some pretty cross words with the people running that care home for a breach of their duty of care to my loved one in a care home. So that's why I think the whole issue of uh, what is very loosely called coronavirus passports needs a lot of thinking because it's about your responsibilities to other people 
as well as your responsibilities to yourself. Now, you can go too far on this. And um, my sister lives in China. And in China, everyone has an app on their phone, which has uh, details of the last time they were tested. It tracks them, uh, tracks their movements with GPS tracking so that it knows if they've been in, a, in an area that's a coronavirus hotspot. And if they have, it won't let them get on any public transport until they've been tested. Um, it, uh, it's fearsomely efficient. It can stop you moving from one district to Beijing to another district to Beijing. Um, but I'm afraid it has all the elements of the police state that China has now become. And it is not what we would want in this country. And in this country, we wouldn't want it because uh, we wouldn't want to tempt our rulers with the, uh, the, the intoxicating power that it would uh, give them to control citizens' movements. That's why we'd reject it here. Um, and that's you know, probably why the Chinese government has gone for it. So I'm not advocating that. But I am saying that I think that if a care home were to say, we only want you to be able to visit us if you can show us evidence that you've had the jab, or an office or a restaurant, um, and they're saying they're doing this uh, out of consideration for the other people you might come into contact with in the course of your visit, then that doesn't just seem to me reasonable. It seems to me safe and actually pretty sensible. So um, that's why I hope it's something that we approach with an open mind. Bernie, I think I'm gonna leave it there and give some time for some of our other panelists to have a few words. Jeremy, that's absolutely fantastic. I'm going to call on Sir Bob Neal uh, just to say a few words before we open it up. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bernard. And uh, Jeremy, thank you very much for, for, for those words. That's uh, uh, really useful and fantastic start to, to the evening. We're delighted from the Society of Conservative Lawyers uh, to be doing this joint uh, meeting uh, with uh, Conservative Health. And as, as Bernard said, I hope we can continue that collaboration uh, for the future. Um, uh, we've got uh, uh, a lot of work that we've done in this field. It says very, it's topical, you're quite right. Actually, the credit must go to, to, to Guy Sandhurst, Lord Hans Sandhurst QC, who is Chair of Research of the Society of Conservative Lawyers, uh, who together with um, uh, our fellow members, uh, Simon Randall and uh, Oliver Pateman, produced uh, uh, our latest pamphlet, COVID Passports, a Necessary Tool to Restore Our Lives, question mark. And emphasis is question mark because it's a discussion uh, paper, uh, but uh, that was part of the genesis for our idea here. Uh, and of course, uh, it's uh, topical too. If you look at the government's COVID-19 response just published yesterday, one of the things we might want to examine and think about is uh, what's the difference between uh, a passport and a, a vaccination status uh, document uh, that's uh, in the COVID vaccine status certification, which is posited in the recovery plan. What's the difference uh, and what's that likely uh, to uh, raise for us? So, so really important uh, issues uh, here. Uh, so um, I think that's probably good, a good way of introduction, uh, Bernard, to, to kick off from the Conservative end. We've got two speakers from uh, the lawyer's side uh, later on. I think, uh, who, who's next? Is it, is it Peter next? There was one um, comment uh, which uh, yeah. I hope to just refer to. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'm just going into the chat. Uh, yeah. uh, there was one comment uh, in the chat uh, which was of interest. Um, uh, it says, how can we counter the scepticism of France and Germany about the Oxford yeah. vaccine? Could they, only ex uh, could they only accept the Pfizer Moderna passports? That was one question. Um, and a, another one, um, surely there are now difficulties with large proportions of the population's immunity, considering the Oxford vaccine appears to offer minimal benefit to the COVID variants. Would a number of countries now no longer allow individuals from the UK having had their vaccine entry, making a viable passport option impractical? Uh, and then one commentary uh, no doubt you're aware that the CEO of the Australian airline Qantas is proposing a COVID passport as a condition of flying. 
uh, that's coming. Jeremy, do you want to just sort of, um, address some of those? Well, I think the government has already said that it's expecting mm -hmm. other countries to make having the vaccine a condition of travel to those countries. So they do want to set up a scheme that's recognised uh, that acts, as Bob describes, as a kind of uh, certificate of vaccination, whether it's a paper certificate or sits on an app on your phone uh, with a barcode, um, you know, who knows. Um, I think the, um, the, the EU, you know, without getting into a discussion on Brexit, has not really covered itself with glory on these vaccine issues. And the AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines, according to the studies that we have, do work very effectively against the variants that are active in the UK. Um, and uh, as far as we can tell, when it comes to the South African variant, uh, they, uh, they might have slightly reduced effectiveness, but they, they do have a degree of effectiveness. And so um, I think, um, you know, it would be um, very unwise for countries to start casting aspersions on them, particularly given yesterday, the, the, the new studies that we have from Scotland yesterday uh, on that issue. But, you know, theoretically, people could do anything with this information. And I think the important thing is to construct a scheme that shows that uh, individuals have taken sensible measures within their power to take. And I think one of the challenges that they have in Europe, and I just throw this open as a thought, is that particularly in France, there is much more scepticism about vaccines and their efficacy. And no one knows exactly why it is that the UK is the most vaccine enthusiastic country on the planet in terms of the proportion of people who say that they are willing to have the COVID vaccine, but it's much higher here than, than, than anywhere else. But I want to suggest to you that perhaps one of the reasons is trust in the NHS. Um, the NHS is our, our most trusted and most loved national institution. As everyone knows, it's far from perfect. We don't get everything right. But it, it's very, very trusted by the public. And therefore, I think that trust is what is making people give vaccines the benefit of the doubt in the way that doesn't happen in some other countries and has perhaps been an unexpected bonus of having a national health service in the crisis that we've just been through. That's, that's really, I've got, that's really helpful, uh, Jeremy. I've got another question, uh, tangential one. It's estimated that there are up to 1.2 million people living in the UK without official documentation. If these people feel they cannot safely apply for an official vaccine passport, it creates a risk of a black market developing as well as discouraging people from getting vaccinated in the first place. What should be done to ensure the highest number of people are encouraged to get the vaccine, regardless of their immigration status? Well, we absolutely will make sure that... Um, <laughs> the public health exemption that applies to all NHS services uh, applies to the vaccines and it certainly would apply to a vaccine passport. So, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, we actually, I, in my time as health secretary, introduced some tougher measures to make sure that people from abroad who haven't paid taxes here, who use NHS care, uh, get properly charged for that care. Uh, but there's always been a very clear public health exemption. So, for example, antiretroviral drugs for people with HIV um, are not charged for, regardless of who they're supplied to. And that would be the same for a COVID vaccine. And I think if you had any kind of vaccine documentation, you would have to make it clear that that would be provided to people, um, regardless of something like their immigration status. Yeah, and, and another uh, question was that uh, uh, <clears throat> many of us may be inclined to agree with you that vaccine passports may be necessary. Surely the important question for libertarianism is at what point can we dispose of the passports lest they linger? Well, the, the international, I think the international passports side of it is out of our hands. It's really when other countries uh, 
decide to stop making a COVID vaccine a condition of travel to that country. Um, but actually that begs a much bigger question of at what point are we going to be able to turn COVID into a normal disease like flu that we just manage? Um, and when we get to that point, you know, my hope that we would be able to completely dispose of, of vaccine passports. But the reason no one can answer quite when we're going to get to that point is because of the one thing that we don't know at the moment. So we know the vaccines work against the variants that are currently in circulation. But what we don't know is whether we're going to see in the next six months a variant that is immune to all the vaccines that are currently being distributed. Now, the scientists I talk to are a bit cagey about this because they, they really don't know. But I, the sense I get is they don't think it's likely. They think we'd have to be pretty unlucky uh, to get a, a variant that was completely immune to the vaccines that are being used, but nor do they think it's impossible. And indeed, they, they do think that ultimately one day we will get that and it will need, I mean the vaccines need to be changed and modified. But it's that degree of uncertainty that means that, you know, Boris was rightly very cautious in his comments yesterday. And I think we can't know for certain when we'll be able to dispense with this kind of scheme. But um, I think that's why we just have to sort of keep a watching brief on it. Another question uh, or comment really um, on the libertarian front is, is uh, comes from uh, Councillor Chris Buckwell from uh, uh, Rochester and Strood constituency. He happens to be an honorary consul in the UK uh, for Sao Tome and, and Principe uh, um, uh, area. And he says, as a frequent traveler to African countries, this is, and this is something that I thought about myself as I'm from Ghana, I keep a 10-year yellow fever certificate with my passport. That doesn't inhibit my liberties and gives me assurance to myself and others with whom I might have contact during the visit. And it does seem rather sort of double, this is me commenting now, double standards, that we don't seem to have a problem about carrying in our passport a 10-year certificate for yellow fever because that's a requirement of entry. And yet we would balk at the prospect of having a, a similar uh, certificate for COVID. Would you like to comment on that? I mean, I, I agree with you on that, Bernie. And, and uh, so I think uh, if we do have a COVID vaccine, it'll just be an electronic version of those uh, yellow fever certificates that many of us have carried with our passports over the years, um, which is why I don't think it uh, needs to be something to be uh, afraid of, that we should be afraid of. But I also think this is where I think conservative lawyers can help us, because I think you could help us work out if there was any legislation required, what are the safeguards that mm. can be put in place? Yeah. I mean, obviously, a sunset clause and the requirement for both houses to vote on these things is a very obvious one. But I think as, as crafty lawyers, you can probably think of some more safeguards that we could put in place in terms of the way uh, such immunity certificates were used to make sure that they were only used for their intended purposes. I mean, I can give you one example of something very straightforward, uh, but this is me speaking as a non-lawyer. But it seems to me that if that information was supplied by the NHS and only accessible by the NHS and not, for example, accessible by the Home Office, um, then that immediately gives people the kind of protection they have over their medical record, which is also very private and can't be accessed by other government agencies. So I think there are things that we could do as, uh, as conservative doctors and lawyers to help make this something that's more, more palatable and less scary. Um, right. Uh, another question, which I, th I think uh, is more a techie one. How do you create a digital passport that can't be faked or copied? And the next one is, what impact will the study of 306 to 17 year olds have in terms of their future vaccination? If the preliminary results are positive, will a larger study be required or will we, or will we be open 
or will we open the vaccination plan up to children of six to 17 based on 300 patient trials? In other words, how big is this trial going to be before we can put the vaccination down to that age group? Well, Bernie, you might have a, a better idea on that one than me, because I don't know what the kind of sizes, the minimum sizes these clinical trials need to be. Um, but personally, I'm actually very enthusiastic about the idea of vaccinating children, because I think that what we've seen over the last year is the enormous priority people attach to keeping schools open and the concern that uh, with coronavirus there is a high amount of asymptomatic transmission, about a third of all transmission. So um, I think it would put lots of people's minds at rest if school children were vaccinated. I'm slightly surprised that we haven't been doing trials on children already because I would have thought it'd be something that'd be very helpful to know um, but my understanding is maybe they are being done and someone can correct me on this, but uh, they certainly haven't been completed yet, yet. But I would have thought this is something that is potentially uh, a very positive step forward. Uh, and then I've got another one here that says a dangerous variant of the virus in India is causing concern. Should Britain not include India in the list of countries that require quarantine? As Foreign Secretary, you traveled around many, many countries. Are there certain traits amongst these that uh, make it difficult for them to control uh, their infections? Well, um, the big lesson from the Ebola crisis in 2015-2016 is that countries with undeveloped healthcare systems, particularly some of the poorer African countries, are much higher risk. And this was the, the big challenge that we had in places like Sierra Leone and, and Liberia and the DRC with Ebola. So it is absolutely the case that one of the ways that we will make the world more resilient to future viruses, and it's, it's a bit of a miracle that you know, this pandemic actually didn't arise in Africa, where many people yeah. would say it's the highest chance of, uh, of a global pandemic arising probably is in Africa. But um, so it is absolutely the case that one of the things we can do to make ourselves more secure is to, um, is to help them have more resilient healthcare systems, particularly in rural areas. I would leave it to the scientists to say which countries we need to introduce tighter controls with. But I just make two observations. I think one of the things that we are definitely going to take away from coronavirus is that in an era of globalization where many of us uh, fully uh, understand the benefits of globalization, uh, we are going to have to learn to shut our borders quickly in emergencies, much more quickly than we did in the last year. And that's just going to be, it's not going to stop the process of globalization, but it's just going to be one of those necessary checks and balances that we have to, to put in place. Um, and you know, secondly, you know, we've got 4,000 variants out there at the moment. So um, our, this country's genomic testing capacity, which is truly world beating, we've been decoding about half of all the coronaviruses that have been decoded genomically since the start of the pandemic across the world. That has made a massive difference and will continue to make a massive difference going forward. And then before I'm going to um, ask some of the panelists if they've got a question to ask uh, while they're thinking about it. One last one. Um, Backtrack is a mobile app that provides this immunity passport you mentioned earlier. You'd like them to be disposable post COVID, but this app is a long term solution for all vaccines. Do you not think there is a future for a digital vaccine passport beyond COVID for things like travel or the flu? Quite possibly, because I can imagine a situation where countries just require um, immunity certificates for a whole range of conditions uh, as one of the lessons that we learn from coronavirus. Um, but I think it might be easier if that was held electronically in a, on a barcode that you have on your phone, uh, possibly linked to your medical record. Um, this is the kind of thing which uh, the NHS could be uh, really uh, leading the world on because um, one of the things I discovered was that the NHS doesn't have a very good reputation for its IT 
but uh, there's one area where the NHS absolutely leads the world, and that's the quality of our GP medical records. Mm. Um, because the GPs very quietly got on and they ignored all Tony Blair's instructions and got on and did their own uh, elect electronification of, of, of the old brown folders that used to see in GP surgeries. And they've been, they, they did it over the last uh, couple of decades. And actually, if you're going to have a record online, the GP record's the one you want because that's your health record for your whole life. Um, and so that could be a very good home for any information about any uh, vaccines that you've had that you might need to show at a border. Excellent. Now, uh, I'm wondering whether any of the panellists would like to come up uh, and uh, ask a question of you. Uh, uh, any offers from, from yeah. our, our panellists? Bernie? Um, yes, Ray? I'll say one yeah. thing. It's, it's more a comment, actually. Jeremy, I think you're so right. And that's the first time I've heard it said, and I just wish now it was said time and time and time again. I'm absolutely certain that the the response to vaccination in this country, and I'm, my jaw drops the fact that a third of our adults have been vaccinated, is because of the NHS. It's the belief of the NHS. And I just think that message, when this is all over, should really, really come out. Well, I agree with that, uh, Ray. And um, by the way, I think it's also worth saying, because he's had a lot of stick at various moments, that Matt Hancock deserves a lot of credit, um, mm -hmm. because he set up the vaccines task force last April. And um, that was, if you remember, that was actually when he just got back from having coronavirus himself and he was frantically trying to get up to 100,000 tests a day, but he still found the time to prioritize this, which has been an absolute game changer. So um, although I know we're very, uh, very used to praising the brilliance of British scientists and British science, I think we do need to give credit to the government for some of the political impetus they gave to uh, what happened on vaccines, which has proved to be incredibly powerful. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's a comment that's come through from Professor Peter Openshaw, who should know, and he says, the vaccination of children is to establish safety and immune responses, not protection. So that's, that's got that one over. Uh, and there's another one here. There will be a, a need. Uh, that's just a spear for a minute. Uh, where is it gone? Uh, there will be a need to reconcile NHS records of who has been vaccinated with a passport database. This will be a significant amount of work to make sure that assurances given to foreign governments are accurate. Is the passport office up to it? In your foreign, where your foreign office uh, at? <laughs> is that something you could answer? I suspect this is not something that is actually going to be in any way actually linked to our passport, um, even though we call it um, a COVID passport. Um, your passport is a physical document that you hold. I suspect this will be something that is more uh, an electronic record of you having, a, a, um, having had a vaccine with a barcode or something that someone could scan, which has a a picture of you or something like that um, and um, I don't think it really matters who 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 does it but um, I, I'm sure that we're more than capable of setting up a scheme that works what you really need is an international scheme which is recognized in in multiple countries uh, here's a question which I think a lot of us feel and we don't actually know the way around it which is that what are we doing to convince so-called anti-vaxxers that the COVID vaccines are safe and of course, we've only got the sort of MMR uh, uh, debacle many years ago to realize that once you put uh, doubt in people's minds, it sticks around for an awful long time. Yes, well, I mean, the, this is a particular problem with vaccines because as the, the medics in this meeting know far better than me, a vaccine is the one medicine, the only medicine that you give to people who are wholly healthy. So our tolerance of side effects is, is almost zero. Um, whereas when you take a chemotherapy drug, uh, you recognize you might lose your hair or whatever it is, but then you've got cancer. So you're, you're weighing the costs and the benefits and your tolerance of side effects is much higher. But when you're uh, vaccinating someone who is healthy, then that tolerance goes right down. 
Um, I think it's been actually very encouraging that we have had a much higher uptake here than people predicted. Uh, but the concern is BME groups and also areas of high deprivation. And what te this, these tend to be areas, um, uh, it tends to be more linked to deprivation than color, although there's obviously a higher proportion of BME people in deprived backgrounds. And the evidence tends to be about, tends to be about people who have very little contact with health services ordinarily. So they're, they're just not having that contact that's building up the trust for, for whatever reason. I know the government's working really hard on this. They really are determined to try and do something about this. Um, but I think what one of the things it does is it, it brings into sharp relief the challenge that we have in this country, which in the medical world is called health inequalities, but for everyone else is basically the fact that the top 10% in this country have 10 years longer life expectancy than the bottom 10%. And I hope that one of the outcomes of, of what happens uh, post pandemic with the sort of general national rethink is that we extend the, the leveling up campaign to health inequalities as well. So we don't just think of leveling up as a north south thing, but we look at the fact that a high proportion of people who are clinically obese are from very poor families and what can we do to help them um, lead more healthy lifestyles and so on? So I, that's a different issue, but, but one that's linked. A closing comment, which is um, quite pertinent to me uh, as someone who, who's over 70 and therefore shielding and so forth, but also BAME. And there's a question that's come in. Uh, there, is an, uh, there is a need for better information to BAME communities about safety data and champions to a door-to-door -door campaign by telephone. I think that's from Show Tibra. Uh, in fact, obviously, there's been a campaign to get celebrity uh, ethnic people to go on television and, and, and uh, um, uh, show themselves having the vaccination. But I wonder that there's a sort of underlying current which comes back from the Tuskegee experiments in the American South when people were given uh, tuberculosis injections uh, to see how, how they would react to it. And, and therefore, there is a suspicion in some communities about vaccines. How would you, if you were in your position as health secretary now, counter this to ensure that one can actually get to this ethnic group who have really suspicions about what's being done to them? I think that uh, this is not something where I, you know, there's anything obvious that the government is not doing that you can that you can land on. They are really taking this very, very seriously. They really, you know, the, the truth is that if we have large chunks of deprived communities who haven't taken the vaccine, it's not just very bad in terms of social justice. It's actually very dangerous for all of us because that means we've got pockets of the country where the virus could, um, once again get a stranglehold so um i think the government is really trying to sort this out um but um i actually think that the the, the covid passport idea could be helpful because it could help us understand exactly where those gaps are um and so and and help us develop new creative ways of reaching out to people who haven't had the jab, who might be persuaded to have it. But um, but I think it's something that uh, everyone can rest assured the government is really focused on and really trying very, very hard to solve. And it's a key part of their strategy to make sure we crack this. Well, Jeremy, thank you very much indeed. You've taken a lot full of more questions than I expected you to take. Um, so Bob, uh, Neil's going to say a few words, but if you feel uh, that you'd like to stay on here the rest of the discussion, do feel free to do so. So, Bob. Thank you. Great. Thanks, thanks very much, Bernie. Uh, thanks very much, Jeremy, for, for, for spending so much time with us. Um, it, it's been a really powerful overview of the, of the, of the position. I, I think uh, we all know that there are lots of sensitivities that the Prime Minister himself recognised in this, and it comes at the interface uh, of medicine and law and, uh, and ethics in its broader sense, as well as politics. I think you captured all of those. And uh, uh, we're all immensely grateful to you. And uh, uh, 
I, I hope we'll try and come up with some some legal answers in the in the next part for some of those questions. Uh, but if not, we have got some personal injury lawyers on the call, you know, who always might be able to give you give you a little little bit of advice as to as to what to do next with that arm of yours. Great to see you back in good form uh, and none the worse for it. Uh, and uh, look forward to catching up with you soon uh, back at Westminster, hopefully. But many thanks, thanks a lot, Bob. Cheers then. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Evening, night all. Thank you very much. Bye, bye. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Right. Well, uh, I, I think everybody would agree that was a very helpful uh, uh, um, comment from Jeremy's. Um, I feel sorry for him with his broken arm, but uh, he was back to work almost the next day. And uh, uh, both as a health secretary and a foreign secretary, and particularly married to a Chinese wife, he has incredible uh, insight uh, into disease spreads uh, around the world. So uh, I'm now going to hand over to Ray and Bob, to Bob, uh, to take over for the next uh, session. And I will retreat to be a member of the audience. Thank you. Well, I think I make a start, Bernie. Yes, off you go, Ray. And uh, the, um, having spent uh, my life in blood cancer, uh, I obviously um, know much of the work that Peter uh, Openshaw has done. At least I thought I did. Right. But when we ask Sarah, uh, who's our brains and our information sources and so on, to just give me a few lines on Peter, what actually happened is the fact that there were two A4 single spaced um, um, uh, 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 lines with what he'd done, actually. And I was astonished. And I've got to say right from the word go, Peter, actually, it is an amazing life that you are having. <laughs> so far achieved. And I've got a few things here. Um, the, uh, it goes right back to the 1980s where you, you did a lot of the original work on RSV. And of course that was a huge virus involved in, in bone marrow transplantation. Right? And I knew about that. Right? Uh, and then what happens is that you got very involved in the influenza epidemic in 2009 and 2010. And I was on IPCLAG at that time, which was the uh, Richmond House Emergency Group. And so I knew again the work you'd done there. But then it starts to come out, right? You're a member of the UK Vaccine Network, <coughs> numerous committees and boards, and oversee research on immunology and respiratory infections. A member of SAGE, I don't know if you still are, but you certainly were a member of SAGE. You're now vice chair of NERV TAG. There's quite a lot of these little names. And that's, as vice chair, you advise the government on new respiratory viruses, right? But what really intrigued me, and it was in the news this week, actually, was the work you've been done, uh, you've been doing on viral infections and studies infecting volunteers, actually. Uh, you're a director of the MRC-funded HIC VAC consortium, right? promote the use of human experimental infections, accelerate vaccine uh, development, co-investigator of the virus characterization study that received ethical, received ethical approval last week. We saw that in the news. I think it's 99 volunteers you're going to have uh, where you're looking for the minimum dose of COVID to be actually be able to produce clinical infection. And uh, so it's been really quite extraordinary. And there are other things, and I've got to pick out one actually, a member of the Academy of Medical Sciences, British Society of Immunology Task Force on the Immunology of COVID-19, of and it goes on and on. So it is with a huge pleasure I'm able to introduce you, Peter, as our first speaker, and in fact, our only speaker on the medical side, because there is a little bit of competition here between the medics and the lawyers, right? Thank you very, very much for coming. Well, thank you so much, Ray. That, that's a very, very kind introduction. Um, I have to speak with slides because <clears throat> I really can't think without slides, I'm afraid. Are you seeing the, the, the slide projection proper or the speaker's view? I, We're seeing the speaker's view at the moment. Speaker's view. Let me just swap that over. OK, so I hope now you should be able to see the slide projection. That good. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. it was... It was very interesting indeed to hear Jeremy Hunt <clears throat> speak so knowledgeably and eloquently um, on many, so many subjects. I've actually seen him speak before when I was president of the British Society for Immunology uh, at a dinner and, uh, and just think he, he is so well informed. 
we're very lucky to have him. Um, so I was just going to just going to quickly go through a few things about um, about the immunology of um, of COVID and particularly about um, vaccines. And I must say this has been an extraordinary thing to witness the rapid development of vaccines um, in in the time of COVID. You know, we wouldn't have imagined this a few years ago when I first went into this this uh, this area. It was taking between 12 and 18 years to make a single vaccine for a single purpose. And we're now seeing a plethora of vaccines in almost no time at all. Now, I, I won't blind you with too much science, but this is just a diagram of a cell infected with um, with COVID. And you can see some some red blobs here. I'll just turn my thing into a pointer so I can point at things. Um, these are these are non-structural proteins which the virus throws out basically to sabotage the cell. So it's equivalent to throwing its clog into the machine in order to <clears throat> stop the stop the uh, machine from operating. And I, I just put this up because we really do know in molecular detail just how the virus interacts with the cell and stops it doing what it would normally do to eject the virus. So one of the great things about vaccines is that they don't actually sabotage the cell. Um, and we can get immune responses out of vaccines these days with modern vaccine technology that's even better than the immune response that you get from natural infection because of this sort of sabotage effort that the, um, that the virus itself is able to make. So this is just a range of different types of vaccine that have been created in the space of less than a year. We've got you know, a vast number of different vaccines um, you know, the conventional vaccines that we're more used to, which were the sort of things that were generated in 1940s, 50s and 60s, were, you know, you take, you take a, a virus and you split it or you inactivate it and then you inject the, the muck that's produced into the, into the arm. But the new vaccines, you know, the RNA vaccines, you know, no, no virus has been harmed in the making of this, of this substance. It's a purely chemical synthetic signature, which when injected into muscle, instructs the muscle cell to make the, the spike protein from the, from the virus, which then creates a, an antibody response using our own natural immune system. And this is uh, absolutely game changing. You know, there are so many other vaccines that we might want to develop in the future, which could use that same sort of technology. So just put some detail, you know, the Moderna BioNTech um, <clears throat> Pfizer vaccines, these are RNA vaccines. Then in Oxford, they've developed this very clever recombinant um, vaccine, which is a disabled chimpanzee adenovirus. Um, and you know, there's such a wonderful range of vaccines. It's been a truly exciting year for somebody like me, who's a bit of a, a bit of a sort of vaccine nerd and likes to follow these things. <clears throat> now, I won't blind you with too much science about the um, about the, um, the the details of how you study the immune response, but just to direct you to this study, this is actually the Moderna vaccine, um, which is you know. I think a very promising one hasn't yet had much publicity, but they tried it at three different doses, um, 25 micrograms. I mean, so this is, um, you know, a, a, a teaspoon of salt is what, 5,000 um, <clears throat> milligrams. I mean, these are tiny, tiny quantities being injected. And you can see that the immune response, which is on this vertical axis, actually exceeds the immune response that you normally get to the actual infection itself. So, you know, these vaccines are really, uh, I mean, this is a logarithmic scale. So it's about 10 times more antibody being generated in response to that vaccine than to the natural infection. So, you know, really, really uh, pretty hopeful. This is, this is the BioNTech um, <clears throat> vaccine the Pfizer vaccine. And again, you can see the antibody responses here. You know, they are at the top end of the range that you would normally see after natural infection. So again, these are extraordinarily effective vaccines. 
And then when you come to look at the efficacy, that's to say the ability of these vaccines to reduce the disease. So that's how they've been tested in these very, very large clinical studies with, you know, in this case, over 11,000 um, individuals. And once the vaccine has generated an immune response, you can see just how much um, it has stopped people getting COVID. So this is much better than any of us vaccinologists thought would, would be achievable. And then you move on to you know, one of the RNA vaccines. And again, you can see on this expanded scale at the top here, that after 12 days, there's virtually no more COVID in those who've received the vaccine. Um, and in the control group, it just goes on up and up. So this is remarkably effective. We're absolutely jubilant that we now have a choice of different vaccines that can, um, that can prevent um, COVID. Um, it was mentioned that there's this great variation in the acceptability of vaccines to the population. And I'm very proud actually to see that the United Kingdom is right at the top on this particular chart. You know, 71.3% of people saying that they would accept the vaccine if it was offered to them compared to just over the channel in France, it's under 30%. So remarkable variations. And I, I do hope that all the efforts that have been made by um, immunologists in this country and, and others to really inform the public has been very, very helpful in getting this acceptability rate um, so high. Um, as we've discussed, there are definitely some pockets of resistance within, um, within society, and we need to work out just how best to reach those uh, parts of the population that, um, that publicity doesn't normally penetrate. But you know, <clears throat> I think the take home message from that bit of science is that vaccines are capable of inducing an even better immune response to the natural infection. Um, we still don't know really how long these immune responses are going to last. Um, there is this lingering uncertainty about whether the immune response caused by an injection into the arm is actually going to protect the nose and the lung from viral replication and therefore whether people are going to still possibly be infectious. Um, and of course, there are concerns over the virus mutation. I think, you know, both of these um, have bearings on just what sort of vaccine passport uh, or certificate um, might be might be rolled out. But I just thought that was that was a quick overview of some of the immunology behind the wonders of uh, vaccination against COVID. So thank you. I think we're having questions at the end, Peter, if we may. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Let's do that. Okay. Um, well, yep. well, Peter, that was that was fantastic. I think we're going to move on to the lawyers, and then we take the questions uh, at the end. Uh, Ray, many thanks for, uh, for 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 dealing with that. Um, there are obviously a lot of legal issues uh, that arise uh, around this, and so we've got two people to look at it. One from uh, the law, as far as it relates to um, data and technology, and then also in relation to the employment aspects, because one of the uses that may arise in this, of course, very much relates. Uh, to in employment matters. So let me introduce, first of all, Dr. Michael Beale. Uh, Michael uh, is a member of the Faculty of Laws at University College London, uh, and his lecture in uh, digital rights and regulation has been since 2019. And he's got a particular ex expertise that sits uh, in that uh, uh, mix, uh, the crossover of computer science, technology law, how that fits with fundamental rights. And we can think about human rights Act considerations, ECHR considerations here, uh, and also uh, how that also fits with uh, data analysis, machine learning, artificial intelligence. It's a, a hugely distinguished academic career and has worked uh, with the European Commission, degrees from Maastricht and, and LSE, my old uh, alma mater. Delighted to see uh, Michael. And he's co authored and authored a number of reports, particularly for the, the um, Law Society. Um, Royal Society, um, work on algorithms in the justice system, and very much uh, more. Uh, so uh, shall we kick off first of all, Michael, over to you. Thank you, Sir Bob. Um, so I want to 
we, we've heard, we heard a lot about uh, potential risks of discrimination and so on. I'm going to leave that mostly to, to Jill to talk about these areas. And there are many facets of uh, vaccine uh, certificates or COVID status certificates, as we've found they're now called yesterday, um, uh, that can be considered. Um, and, and I invite people to look for those aspects to also look at recent reports, such as the one from Society of Conservative Lawyers and also the Ada Lovelace Institute and so on, which cover these. And I want to spend my time today highlighting an issue that I don't think has been talked about very much at all, but I actually see as a really, the one of potentially the core political issue of doing, uh, going down this path. So firstly, when we think about the technical aspect of a vaccine certificate, um, when we think about a digital one, what do we need to uh, actually do technically? Well, on one hand, we have two main components. We have a component that requires us to, to establish whether a valid test or a vaccination has been carried out and that it is linked to a certain person. Right? So we can think of that as one, as one component. You know, usually we would have that in a medical record or something like that, uh, and we would trust that to be true. But if we think about a broader system, that's a, a freestanding component. Then we have the other component, which is proving that the person in front of you is the person who has that uh, medical record or that vaccination record or test record, whatever uh, you know, policy you have attached to them. So you can see these as two different problems um, and we have to look at them uh, together. So the first one about uh, getting the, the vaccine associated with a certain person, um, when we think of this in international context, you know, these could be used for travel, people might be moving around the world with these, um, with these apps or certificate systems. Uh, having this become uh, interoperable, working across borders, is very, very difficult. You know, we haven't uh, got, we won't get overnight um, compatible health records across the world. You know, it's just not going to happen. We haven't had it uh, for, for many years prior. We're not going to get this within 2021. That's magical thinking. So just this, the kind of the simple, uh, the first block of that will have to be a bit of a fudge. We'll have to work with a huge variety of systems. Some people will have been more centrally vaccinated in their own countries, uh, for example, in the NHS. But even in the UK, we'll have people who are part of clinical trials or people who are pregnant at the time of, of vaccination being rolled out and, and maybe fell into different categories. And if there are variants in the future and we start to need to test rather than rely on the vaccinations that have already been delivered, then we will have a variety of providers who might not always have standardized systems either. So I think that first section we can say, maybe you could domestically standardize in very homogenous countries. Some countries like Denmark, vaccination certificates of that type are very easy because they already have apps with their health records on which display their current vaccinations. So you know, insofar as that already exists and they've got centralized health systems uh, working with those, uh, those systems, then they can do that. We find that broadly across Scandinavia and health informatics is of course very advanced in Scandinavia as sort of the birthplace of that, of that domain. So that's the first part and the context of that. Um, and the second part um, is equally tricky in a different way. It's how do you prove you are who you say you are? Again, in some countries, we have existing infrastructures we can piggyback on, countries with national ID systems, countries like Estonia with very digital national ID systems that fit with mobile systems or computers or the like. And therefore those, those kind of mechanisms already exist in a very universal way. As we all know, in the UK, we don't all have some uh, shared card. Not everybody has a passport. Um, you know, even if you do, you might have to get it sent off for a visa or you might have to, you know, it gets expired at some point. Um, so we don't have a simple thing that we can piggyback on. So if we were worried about this, we need to think about uh, 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 building a new infrastructure for this. And this is both of these of the two main parts of a certificate. So the first thing you think about is what are the threats? Whenever I, uh, I work between law and computer science, and when you work with computer security uh, uh, researchers and practitioners, they will say, if you say, can you make me a secure computing system? They'll say, stop, stop, stop. What is your threat model? Are you trying to defend against GCHQ or are you trying to defend against Facebook or are you trying to defend against you know, somebody in, a, in an office making a mistake and BCCing in? or CCing in all of the people into an email, what is your, what's actually the concern of the threat model? So a lot of the time, you know, some privacy technologies are designed to defend against GCHQ, but actually they, you know, they don't defend against uh, your abusive partner taking your phone and reading your messages, who has it, you know, uh, who coerces it off of you. So you've got to think of what the threat model actually is. So here, 
we have to think about this in terms of fraud. If you're trying to secure a system, uh, how resilient a fraud do you want to make it? If you want to make it fully resilient, so really nobody can, can prove that they had a test or a vaccine who didn't have it, well, I'm afraid this can't be really an international system. As I've said, you're not going to standardize the giving of vaccines at this point very easily. Uh, the, 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 across the world, you're not going to standardize health records. So someone can always come in and say, well, I have a vaccine or a test from a different jurisdiction, and you have to allow them to prove this in some way. So there's going to be a bit of a fudge. You know, it's like how we do it with, um, with the certificates inside your passport for yellow fever. It's stamped and signed by a clinic. And of course, in many countries, these are, you know, these are traded as, uh, you, sometimes it's cheaper to buy a yellow fever certificate, I've heard, than it is to get the actual vaccination. So there, are, there is a market for these in some countries. So uh, we have to think about what we secure it against. So similarly, if we think that this whole bottom layer is potentially problematic and some, if you have a really determined person could prove uh, that they are who they say, they, um, uh, while they are who they say they are, they didn't actually have a vaccine, then we have to question the whole, the whole approach. So I want to call a little bit for, on, on that regard for the value of paper. So the value of paper is what are we actually trying to achieve with, with fraud protection here? Are we trying to make a really watertight system or a system where the vast majority of people will not act fraudulently in this, in this, uh, in this approach? So I want to also just, just focus on that a little bit and think about that aspect. And the last thing I want to say um, is that, so that's one part that it's, it's, uh, you know, we have to think about what the threat is. The second part is the time scale. As I've said, you, if you want to do a, a digital, you know, shiny digital system, you are not going to get a shiny, secure digital system that works internationally within 2021. It is not happening. It, is not, it can't be pulled out of the hat because it requires everyone to be moving in concert. And it took us so long to get biometric passports. That standardization process is very, is very slow. What you might get in towards the end of this year, next year, is the private sector standardizing huge components of this. They're the only ones who can move across countries without diplomatic uh, bickering in this area, who can provide take it or leave it offers to health providers. Um, and they particularly don't have a very strong interest in providing COVID passports. They have a strong interest in providing identity infrastructures that will make them a lot of money. And we're talking about the really the large tech companies, even the large phone operating systems here that will do this across borders. So the political debate we, we have to have is if, we don't, if we're not careful with designing and imagining a vaccine certificate or a COVID status certificate, what we will do is create a system that is over-engineered for 2021, that we doesn't really deliver anything additional in terms of security than we would have got with some paper, paper certificates or you know, very simple digital certificates that are like paper, like you have a train ticket, for example, you know, on your phone, but it doesn't, you can't biometrically read your face, the train ticket. And we might also, in quite an illegitimate and undemocratic way, have sold our identity infrastructure to a large company that we can't take it back from, that makes a global standard that the UK has no ability to really set or influence. And that could really create some problems down the line. Um, we have to, we have to be careful that we're not, we're not um, really uh, uh, selling something that, that we don't need to sell at this point, because the discussion of how to create a UK digital identity system is something that I think needs to be given more care than a than a really rapid uh, pushed out process. So that's the kind of set of lessons that I'd like to focus on. And I think the, the latter part about infrastructure and who is running it is where we have to take our focus because it's not 2021 we're debating about, it's 2022, 23 and beyond when we talk about digital certificates and we should treat it like that process. So thanks a lot and uh, looking forward to discussion and questions. Well, thank you very much, Michael. That, 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 that's great. And it does highlight, doesn't it, that uh, you can't take these things in isolation. Uh, and we've often seen in many areas what seems as a, a useful short term uh, expedient uh, might of itself seem benign, can then actually open up a vast number uh, of other much broader considerations, uh, legal, political, philosophical uh, and ethical as well. And you encapsulated that, that very well. One of the areas, of course, that uh, that it may be particularly relevant were there to be a passport, a certificate or, or whatever, it is going to relate to people's employment rights. Uh, and that's why our next speaker, uh, Jill Andrew, is, uh, is, is going to uh, help us on that. Uh, Jill's uh, got well, over 30 years experience uh, in, in uh, the law and throughout that time she's been a specialist in employment law, particular expertise in discrimination. Uh, she's been uh, head of employment and, uh, and a partner at a number of major uh, London 
uh, law firms uh, within the party. Uh, she's been a parliamentary candidate, uh, an assessor for parliamentary candidates, uh, an advisor to the board on disciplinary uh, and compliance matters, uh, and uh, is also currently a, a member of the executive of the Society of Conservative Lawyers. Uh, she's a product of Exeter University and again LSE. So uh, don't feel left out if you weren't. Uh, but uh, uh, Jill, uh, many thanks for um, joining us tonight. And she's also a very good old chum of mine and a former leader of Bromley Council and a former constituent of mine. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'll allow for moving down to Kent now. But uh, uh, great to see you again, Jill. And uh, uh, over to you, particularly on this the employment and discrimination aspects. <clears throat> Thank you, Sir Bob. And um, I thought I'd start, I'd start by um, commenting on a letter that Mr. Graham Wright of Cambridge managed to get published in The Telegraph last week. He wrote, Sir, where does it leave an employer if ethnic minority employees refuse or have refused the COVID vaccine? The implications for race relations are horrendous, let alone the legal issues relating to employment. Well, I hope that tonight I'll be able to show that many fears that people have expressed about the impact of employment in relation to the pandemic are somewhat exaggerated and that the legal issues relating to jabs for jobs and vaccine passports are not quite as insurmountable as people have suggested. In the time available, I'm going to do a quick canter through five re relevant aspects of employment law and I'll do so under five headings, namely health and safety law, contract law, unfair dismissal law, discrimination law, and whistleblowing. The starting point, of course, is that under the Public uh, Health Control of uh, Diseases Act 1984, people cannot be compelled to have a vaccine. But can employment law provide a backdoor route to compulsory vaccination and vaccine passports? And I think by the time I finish, you'll understand that it may well do so. Under Health and Safety at Work uh, Act, employers have a duty to ensure, so far as is reasonably practical, the health and safety and welfare at work of all their employees. Employees have a duty to take reasonable care for the health and safety of themselves and those who may be affected by their acts or omissions, and to cooperate with their employers to enable the employer's duties to be performed. There is then a comparable duty in relation to self-employed people, and they have a duty to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, the health and safety of those who are affected by their work. In the context of the pandemic, there could well be circumstances in which employees and other workers would be able to successfully claim that their employer has not gone far enough in protecting their health and safety by, for example, requiring them to work alongside non-vaccinated colleagues or clients. However, in practice, this is more likely to be played out in the arena of unfair dismissal legislation, and I'll come on to deal with that shortly. In relation to contract law, there's a distinction to be drawn between existing employees and current uh, and new employees. I'll deal with the position concerning existing employees under unfair dismissal legislation. However, in relation to new employees, it is possible to impose a contractual obligation on them to be vaccinated and to carry a vaccine passport. And I say this with more than a degree of confidence, as our esteemed Lord Chancellor, the Right Honourable Robert Buckland, has indeed acknowledged publicly that this is the case. The same principle would also apply to self-employed and those employed as workers, but, and particularly those who do not have the protection of unfair dismissal law. There have been a number of newspaper reports about employers seeking legal advice on how to impose such conditions in their contracts. These reports are, of course, anecdotal. And it's not clear how widespread this practice has or indeed will become, but there certainly seems to be an appetite amongst employers for compulsory vaccination and vaccination passports through their contractual arrangements. In relation to unfair dismissal, it's important to say at the outset that unfair dismissal legislation only applies to employees. Therefore, people who are self-employed or are workers, for example, in the gig economy, they are not covered and nor indeed are people with less than two years in uh, continuous employment. The consequence of this is that subject to the impact of discrimination law, which I'll deal with shortly, an employer would be free to terminate the contracts of employment of all employees with less than two years service. And those who are not employees, who are not prepared to be vaccinated or carry a vaccine passport if they so choose. 
and there would be nothing that people affected by this could do about it from an employment law perspective. For those, who, for those employees who do have two years service, the protection available in relation to jobs for, for jabs may not be to all encompassing. Under unfair dismissal legislation, there are three points to be considered. The employee has to be dismissed, whether actually or constructively. The employer has to have a potentially fair reason for dismissal as set out in the legislation. And the employer has to follow a fair procedure in relation to, that, in relation to the dismissal. Lawyers like me have not been paid insignificant sums of money over the years to bring about changes in employment contracts. And there are a number of ways in which this can be done. The first and most obvious way is to offer employees an incentive to agree to the new term, a bonus, for example, a bottle of champagne even, to agree to be vaccinated or carry a vaccine passport. If the employee accepts the incentive, the change to the terms and conditions can just be documented and that change then just takes effect. But what if an employee is not prepared to agree to the change and holds out? The employer then has the option to terminate the employment Provided the employee is given the requisite period of notice provided for under their contract, um, that will satisfy any claims the employee may have for breach of contract. And this, this notice may either be worked or paid in lieu of. I mentioned that a dismissal can be constructive. Constructive dismissal is where an employee fundamentally resigns uh, in response to a breach of the employer's contract of employment, uh, a breach of his contract of employment. And that resignation is, in, is treated in law as a dismissal. Constructive dismissal may arise in one of two ways in the pandemic scenario. An employee may, may resign and claim constructive dismissal because they feel unfairly pressurised or even bullied into having a vaccine or having to carry a vaccine passport. Or employees may resign because they do not wish to work alongside someone who has not been vaccinated. An employer may be able to argue that a dismissal based on a refusal to vaccinate or carry a vaccine passport is fair on the basis that the dismissal amounted to some other substantial reason, which is a potentially fair reason under the unfair dismissal legislation. And it seems the most likely way in which an employer will be able to argue this is where there has been what's normally referred to as third party pressure to dismiss. Let me give some examples here, and perhaps alighting on what Jeremy Hunt said earlier. Supposing Mr. Smith works in a care home, and is responsible for the management and care of one of the dementia blocks in the, in the home which requires special skills. He's not prepared to be vaccinated. There are 12 re residents on the floor for which he's responsible. The relatives of the elderly patients all band together and complain that they don't want their loved ones looked after him by him anymore. The employer tries to persuade them that, they, that their fears are not well founded and there are proper COVID uh, precautions in place which will pre prevent any risk to their families but they remain unconvinced. They then say, unless he's removed, they'll remove their relatives from the care home. The employer then has to consider whether he can redeploy him or not, but comes to the conclusion that he cannot do so. In those circumstances, would Mr. Dismiss will be fair? I think almost certainly the answer is yes, provided the employer followed the procedure that I've indicated. Another example, Mr. Ms. Green runs a small IT company she employs 12 staff. They work in open plan offices. There are good social distancing arrangements in place and the COVID um, precautions also seem of a good standard. But 11 of her 12 staff have been vaccinated, but one holds out and says he's not prepared to get that, he or she says he's not prepared to be vaccinated. The other staff say they will not work with that person again. Again, provided Mrs. Green follows a fair procedure and seeks to mediate between the factions and achieve a resolution if she fails to do so, there must be a strong argument that her decision to dismiss will be fair under the legislation. So there may be circumstances in which an employer can, unfair, can fairly dismiss people who refuse to have a vaccine or carry a vaccine passport. Although I would say that the examples I've given are very particular on their facts. And I think it's unlikely that there will be many circumstances in which a dismissal for refusal to vaccinate or, or carry a passport would be upheld. But the examples in which employers might succeed might be slightly wider than the newspapers have suggested so far. I mentioned earlier about changing terms and conditions of employment. I could probably spend about the next hour talking about that and I won't do so, of course. 
But the way this is done is that an employer gives notice of termination of employment on, on the prescribed notice under the contract. And then once that expires, they offer the employee a new contract imposing the new term, for example, a term that they have to be vaccinated and carry a passport. If the employee refuses to accept the new contract in practice, they will be able to recover little compensation because the way unfair dismissal compensation works is they will have suffered no loss because the pay and rations under the old contract will be very, very similar to the pay and rations under the new contract. But it's a very difficult situation for an employee to refuse a new contract, particularly if employment opportunities are limited at that time. Moving on to discrimination uh, legislation, we're talking here in, in the context of the pandemic of indirect discrimination. Indirect discrimination arises where a practice policy or rule is applied which disadvantages a group who share a protected characteristic. The protected characteristics under the Equality Act are our sex, race, religion or belief, age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity. Now, him, Nadim Zadwala and other ministers have resisted calls for compulsory vaccines and vaccine passports on the basis that this would be discriminatory. But is this right as a matter of law? What is clear is there's been a noticeably lower take up um, of the vaccine by some BAME communities. And there must be a concern that a compulsory vaccination and passports were to be introduced, that these communities would argue that they are being wrongly discriminated against. But there is a defense to indirect discrimination. Indirect discrimination may be objectively justified if there is, if it is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. In yesterday's Downing Street briefing, Professor Chris Whitty commented that for many years, doctors undertaking surgery have to have a hepatitis B jab. And he went on to say that he regarded having a vaccine as a professional duty for doctors and care workers. I was also reminded over the weekend by a friend who used to be main board HR director for British Airways, that for many years, pilots and cabin crew have had to be vaccinated and carry vaccine passports before they could fly into particular countries. In dealing with these issues, the courts would have to strike an objective balance between the discriminatory effects of compelling people to have a vaccine and carry a vaccine passport and the needs of the organisation to impose this. There may well be circumstances, for example, again in the care industry and other related organisations where it would be possible to argue that the imposition of the requirement to have a vaccine was a legitimate aim in all the circumstances. And at the risk of giving Charlie Mullins of Pimlico Plumbers any more publicity, his argument that he's not prepared to send in plumbers into people's houses unless they have the vaccine because he's not prepared to put his customers' health at risk is not without attraction. So I think, again, as with unfair dismissal, there may be circumstances in which it is legitimate to discriminate by imposing a requirement on employees and other workers to have a vaccine and carry a vaccine passport. But again, this will depend on particular circumstances. Just very briefly, I'm going to touch on whistleblowing for the sake of completeness. There is protection of, uh, for people who make what is known in the legislation as protected disclosures. A protected disclosure must relate to one of the prescribed categories one of which is that, and I quote, the health and safety of any individual has been or is likely to be endangered. And the person making that must be reasonably believed that it is in the public interest to make such a disclosure. Whistleblowers acquire the right to protection from day one of employment. And, they are, and if they are treated detrimentally by reason of having made a protected disclosure, their dismissals will be automatically unfair. During the pandemic, there has been an exponential rise in whistleblowing cases, and we may see more of these as these issues relating to vaccines and vaccine passports become more prominent. And can I just conclude by saying that as an employment lawyer from the now notorious county of Kent, since the emergence of the Kent variant, I'm enormously grateful to be having my jab on Friday. <laughs> I'm sure I speak for all my lawyer colleagues here tonight by thanking those members of Conservative Health for all the work they are doing during what must, what must be one of the most challenging times in any medics' careers. We owe you so much and thank you.
Thank you very much, Jill. That's a, that, that's a very comprehensive overview, I think, of the, of, of the legal issues uh, and also um, a very apt way to end as a, uh, uh, as, a, as a Kent lawyer who's benefited from the vaccine from uh, uh, Kent uh, uh, medics. I totally agree with you. I can stretch, stretch the greater London boundary to say that Brom has always been in Kent historically anyway. So uh, I think we'll certainly say that and we're really mass massively grateful to all our medical colleagues. Um, uh, a few questions starting to, to come in, but I just wanted um, to, to get uh, perhaps some of the, the panel's takes on, on, on what uh, each other have been saying. And can I kick off by, by not, not raising an issue that you just mentioned, Jill, uh, but take it a stage further. Um, that's come to me ar around the idea of, we talked about care home staff and we talked about Charlie Mullins employing his plumbers. A lot of local authorities, as you would know, pro, uh, under their responsibilities under the Social Care Act, uh, provide domiciliary care, very often through agencies. Um, uh, they don't have a direct or a contractual relationship with the um, uh, domiciliary care worker. Uh, but of course, uh, one, one can imagine a local authority wanting to have very robust discussions with the agency that provides uh, the care on that on their behalf if they get as we're picking up in some places concerns expressed by um vulnerable people whose homes those care workers are going into or their families uh, would, would the same considerations apply with the fact that uh, these are agency staff and their contract is with the agency but um in effect the the the, the funding and, and the work is provided uh, by, by the set by that separate contract with the local authority make might make much difference I think in, in those circumstances, the, the, the contractual relationship would have to operate between the, the local authority and the, the agency itself. Yeah. Because um, there wouldn't be any direct, we're into the yeah. realms of privity of contract, aren't we, without getting too yeah. lawyerish. Um, um, so I would think that that would have to be managed either by the local authority with the agency, but the, the alternative is that the the vulnerable you, you look at it bottom bottom up as yeah. well you know if the vulnerable person or their relatives are saying i don't want this person to come in if they're not vaccinated um you know there must be some some relationship between the agency and the vulnerable person i would have thought yeah yeah okay that, that, oh, sorry that, that's not a very clear answer on that yeah it's not totally straightforward i i, I agree with you um uh, michael i don't know if, if you well, I come in observations with... on um, the, the Chris Whitty point that Jill referred to, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, the idea that this is perfectly acceptable in, in certain types of medical practice, uh, and uh, uh, that, that, uh, that, that does that, to your mind, create any difficulties around the ethical and, uh, and broader considerations that you were talking about to us? I think, I think you know, it's, a, it's an ethical decision, and, and you know, one of my students has been doing some reviews of this and shown many countries have, have uh, uh, laws mm -hmm in certain areas or, or sectors. One area where it becomes more difficult, and, and particularly you know, we, if we go down this path in general, you know, thinking about you know, the sort of the new 9-11, we've seen sort of terrorism and security, now biosecurity, and changing a lot of aspects of our lives and the way we run institutions maybe, then one concern is that you might have employers processing a wide array of health data. And, um, and, and in terms of the intersection between employment law, contract law, and data protection law, you do find some interesting intersections there. You can't force somebody to consent, but consent is one of the only ways in which you can process health data as a private actor without be making a new statutory um, uh, power for them to, for them to do so effectively, or a statutory basis rather. Um, so so there, is, there is some challenges here of how much do we expect employers to be processing that data and how much rights do individuals have to, to control that, which does create some interesting intersections. But that generally, I think, wouldn't create problematic intersections when you've clearly got a sector where you know, there is a clear risk um, and, and, and so on, where you've got a, a workplace where, um, uh, where you could justify, particularly in a public sector context. Yeah. So I, I think that's the kind of it's an interesting area, but it's probably more of a point where you might find people try to litigate on it than one that is not is irresolvable, because much of that can be dealt with through um, delegated legislation by just creating a new ability for employers to process information about people's vaccine records. You know, that can be dealt with, but it may take a parliamentary action. So, Bob, could I ask a question? Yes, do. Come on in. Yeah, right. 
Well, Peter, first of all, thanks hugely for your talk. Um, the, there's two components uh, to COVID. There is the sort of flu-like illness, and then there is the catastrophic cell, ca uh, cell cascade that fills the intensive care units. Toby, I mean, is there any data at the moment about the vaccines preventing the people going into intensive care? And secondly, is there a test, which is presumably outside of an antibody test, presumably involves T cells or something, that lets you predict which ones may or may not? And incidentally, thanks hugely for your talk. It was a fantastic talk. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's I mean, the, for you, isn't it? Yes. The, I mean, in terms of trying to predict um, who's going to develop very severe disease, the there's a, there's a study that um, we've been running which has involved um, most of the people admitted to hospitals, NHS hospitals um, in this country, um, where we've been looking at the immunology prospectively. And I think we can, to some degree, predict who is going to go into hospital and who is going to um, who is going to need intensive care and who who may die. Um, it's a it's quite complex and it's a it's a very very important. Uh, problem to try and anticipate. And I, I must say that all the data is coming out showing that vaccines, even if they're effective, they sort of move the pyramid of severity downwards so that there are fewer people dying, fewer people going into intensive care and fewer people going to hospital. So more people developing milder disease. So I think, you know, that's another bit of good news with the vaccines, even if we do get variants it will probably shift that pyramid in a downward direction so we don't see so much bad bad illness. Thank you very much. Great. There's another sort of medical related one here, perhaps, uh, Peter, that you might be able to help with. Um, Emmett Coldrick, uh, a substantial proportion of vaccinated people can still catch and spread COVID. Is rapid antigen testing not a better solution than vaccine passports if it's needed? Well, those, the, so the rapid antigen tests, um, <clears throat> they're getting more reliable. The ones that we purchased originally were, I'm afraid, not very good, and some of them completely useless. But, yeah. the, but some, of the, some of the tests are actually rather good now. And the argument for them is that they pick up people who are highly infectious uh, and don't necessarily pick up people who've just got a bit of viral debris lying around in their noses, which you know, it can persist for several weeks and actually probably isn't very infectious. So there is there is um, an argument for using those tests, particularly if you use them repeatedly or use them on populations so you can see that a particular social group has virus circulating amongst them. Quite successful on, on that basis. Right. Uh, somebody else raised, James Morris, who's a retired pathologist. Do the vaccine, vaccines induce... Um, secretory IgA to protect against mucosal infection. I hope I got that right. This is yeah, a very interesting so, particular dimension. Yes, yes. So, it's, so I'm really a mucosal immunologist. You know, right. um, most of the cells of the immune system are actually concentrated in your moist surfaces of your nose and your gut. Um, over 90% of them are actually there because that's where they need to be in order to defend against these pathogens. And of course, we don't much sample those because it's quite hard to get a piece of tissue. It's much easier to do a blood test. But um, what we need to do is develop vaccines that are uh, nose sprays or nose drops. And actually, there is a trial just going to be initiated um, at Imperial, um, which I'm a, a, a small part of, where we're actually taking some of the vaccines and using them as nasal sprays and seeing what they do in terms of protection. But it is the way we ought to go, really, is, is making sure the immune system knows that that's where the action is and where it ought to concentrate. Great. That's, that, 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 that's, uh, that's really helpful. But a bit of a legal one um, uh, now for perhaps uh, Michael and Jill uh, from John Pollard. Um, there's a clear ethical concerns for people who can't be vaccinated for um, medical reasons uh, is the most obvious one, um, as opposed to those who choose not to. Um, are, are there any suggestions? What will be the position? I suppose, paraphrase it in, in employment law and other, other law. If somebody says, look, I, I have a medical uh, reason, I assume that will be a, a good defence against dismissal, essentially. Um, what about the position of somebody who claimed they had a religious objection uh, to uh, a vaccination? 
Um, where do you think that might stand in relation to, uh, to the legal position? Anybody help on that one? Shall I take, shall I take yeah. that? Uh, yeah, and then go, if go, Michael's go. got any comments. Um, in, re in relation to someone who cannot have a vaccine, but can I just say, I've just got a kitten crossing. A, there's obviously problems with cats and, uh, and um, videos. Um, just coming to say hello. That was my lockdown surprise. I, I adopted a farm kitten, uh, cat thinking I was, I was being terribly helpful. And she arrived on the Friday and produced kittens on the Tuesday. But there we are. <laughs> this is one of them. Um, in, in, Are you going to tell everybody what the cat's name was, though, originally, Jill? <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. Um, the cat was called Boris. <laughs> um, but then gave birth. So um, we've decided to call her Bojo, just to just keep the theme going. <laughs> um, the little black one you've just seen is called Kiwi because he's all black. Um, to answer the question, um, there's obviously a thing about lawyers and cats, if, if anybody did see the filter with the lawyer advocating with the cat filter on. Um, to, answer, to answer the point, if somebody has a genuine medical reason um, that they cannot have the, 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 the jab for whatever, you know, if it's a legitimate medical reason. I know, for example, my, my husband, I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning, has a medical condition, which means he can't have yellow fever vaccine. So those circumstances can arise. I cannot c c comprehend a court would say in those circumstances that a treatment it is about balancing interests, and I cannot conceive that a court would say that it would be fair to dismiss someone in those circumstances, unless you are under extreme pressure to dismiss. And in relation to religious beliefs, I think that's more difficult because, um, from what I understand, say, for, for example, the Islamic, uh, the Muslim community, they've said there is no um, religious reason why the vaccine should not be taken. But having said that, quite significant numbers of the Muslim community are not taking up the vaccine. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that again is about balance. You know, I said it's, the courts will have to objectively justify. That's that's yeah. the position yeah. they would take. And it is about balancing the interests of one group against, against the other group. Yeah. Um, so, Michael, I don't know if you have any more thoughts on that. Yeah, I well, so as I mentioned about the fraud issue, I think there's, there's a few aspects here. We, we can see this in the same lens. And I think this is where it will be really useful to have the input of epidemiologists as well. And we're obviously seeing data feed in um, slowly about this. Now, what, how much, how precautious do we actually have to be? Uh, you know, how, how, uh, uh, how many people who present a vaccine certificate, but actually, you know, they're presenting one of their flatmate. Is that really going to be a problem? What's the proportion of people who would have to do that for it to be a problem? Similarly, what's the proportion of people who would have to not have them, um, you know, who might be moving with religious obligations or uh, of, of religious objections or, uh, or, or medical uh, or medical reasons, which would cause a, a medical and epidemiological problem here. So we have to think about, about that lens, I think. Uh, and you know, we then also, I think, you know, can't, we can't avoid the divorces from the whole system. So like we saw with masks, we didn't start to put a legal obligation on supermarkets to police the wearing of masks. We didn't, we didn't render them liable for letting somebody in who had a mask because I think that would have been absurd and it would have you know, created, you know, turn people who weren't trained to, to, to have that role into having an enforcement role. And of course that would go wrong in myriad ways. Similarly, I don't think this is the elephant in the room. If we do move this beyond an airport, which of course is a very securitized area into theatres or restaurants or so on who on earth is going to turn people away or really do a proper check of whether this thing is is valid or not you know we are living in magical thinking world if we're if we are saying let's pay loads of money and get an international tech company to bulldoze through have a standardized identity system which is potentially going to cause big political fireworks and flashpoints and lots of you know uh, potentially other problems as well as lose uk sovereignty over the ability to control that in the future um, even though in the end people will just show anything and walk into a restaurant because no one's going to police them. So we, I think we, we have to see the whole system in the same way as, as you know, in the area that Jill works in. We, but plenty of times we, we deal with people showing um, qualifications to people who aren't really qualified to judge whether those qualifications are real or not. And you have a whole array of so social and, and, and sanctions, you know, 
around don't do that it could be that you get you know pushed out of your sector you might it might not be uh you know, it might just be on on kind of uh, social sanctions rather than actual uh, the law gets involved um uh, you know of course you can get fired for having shown a fake qualification but there are various you know um levers that, and, uh, that actually prevent this from being a really big problem in reality so i think we just have to think in that and i just don't think i see that thinking very much in um in much of the discourse that's going around uh, today. So let's keep zoomed out and think about all the dimensions. Okay. Peter, anything from the medical uh, aspect around sort of the forgery and, the, the, and potential fraud around that? Are there ways that that can be prevented in some way? No, I mean, I was very struck by, the, by Jeremy Hunt's comment about the faith we have in the NHS. Um, and, you know, maybe that, that uh, trust that we do have in the NHS might in some way be used to reinforce the confidence that people yeah. have in certificates, but I, I don't have any particular medical comment to add to that. In it. That's, that, that's great. Well, look, we, we, we've, we, we've had a really good discussion and we, we've already run over time. Um, uh, so I'm uh, probably gonna, we probably need to, to, to wrap it to a close, unless you're, if you're happy with that, Ray. Yes, very happy. If I, if you're closing now. Yeah, you have said, you said a few things. things. Um, but, um, I was absolutely intrigued. This worked actually. I understood the legal side, right? I, both the speakers were clearly excellent, but I just understood the arguments, and uh, and it really got me thinking. And it was also so good to have Jeremy as a medical person, and then of course Peter to give us the icing on the cake. And uh, so on my side, thank you, and then thank you the uh, guy and Sir Bob uh, for helping putting us together and I know Bernie feels very well about it as well. Great, great. Many thanks Ray, that's fantastic. Yeah. Guy, um, thank you very much for all the work you've done on, on getting this set up, much appreciated. Well, thank you very much to Bob and all our speakers uh, tonight um, uh, and on behalf of for Conservative Health just echo what Ray has said, I think it's been an excellent meeting and it's incumbent on you to organise another one in a couple of years time. <laughs> Can I think we ought to do that. Can I just say thank you to, all, to everyone for taking <laughs> part? I, I had this idea about three or four weeks ago, and it's been brilliant, and we've had a really good evening. I think we must do them yeah. again. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. We could have gone a lot longer. Not at least because there was a question about the Sputnik vaccine, but I thought that would keep us going forever. But <laughs> anyway, okay. thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Great to see Bye. you. I look forward to, to, to continuing the collaboration between our two societies. All the best. Indeed. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.